Welcome everyone to the second annual Omer Aliyah, a seven-week spiritual boot camp of personal elevation, or simply known as TOA. This is the sixth class of our seven-class empowerment series. My name is Nuriel Shor, and in partnership with Hashem, I am the founder of the Omer Aliyah. Welcome to participants from the United States, Canada, Israel, England, Australia, and Uganda who have joined us on this journey of holy transformation and spiritual evolution. The vision is for all Jews of all backgrounds around the world to be part of a global movement of revealing our individual and collective greatness through Svirata Omer, the counting of the Omer. I'd like to now take this moment to thank and recognize our amazing uh, sponsors who have enabled this initiative to be free of charge for all any and all participants uh, as well as also have, has, have allowed this initiative to be sustainable long term. I'd also like to thank our various community partners for helping to spread the message, spread the word, and to just share in this vision. If anybody's interested in sponsorship or being a community partner, you can always email me at omeraliyah at gmail.com. The mission of the Omer Aliyah is to serve as a spiritual detox of the klipot, the barriers that are preventing us from accessing Hashem and our highest selves while simultaneously building a foundation of spiritual power. Practically speaking, the essence of the Omer Aliyah is tikkun amidot, repairing, refining, and elevating our character attributes based on the lower seven svirot, which correspond to these seven weeks. By emulating these divine attributes, we transform into conduits of peace, love, and blessing for ourselves, for others, and for all of creation. The structure of the boot camp consists of four in-person community gatherings in Los Angeles, seven virtual empowerment classes taught by seven teachers, and 49 days of individual learning and growth. For more information on the Omar Aliyah or to start your own Toa community wherever you are in the world, email me at omaraliyah at gmail.com. We're concluding, excuse me, we are in the week of Yesod, and we have the zechut of having David Sachs. David is a senior lecturer at the Happy Meeting of Los Angeles and gives the weekly podcast, Spiritual Tools for an Outrageous World. He is also an Emmy and Golden Globe uh, winning writer and producer for television. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping remarks. This class is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Omar Aliyah YouTube channel. So please hold all your questions and comments until after the class finishes. I will then stop the recording, after which we will have an opportunity for open and confidential conversation with David. May Hashem bless the Omer Aliyah and all who are involved, so that Klai Yisrael may discover the greatness within and bring about individual, collective, and global geula speedily in our days. I now hand the class over to you, David. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Thank you for... Uh allowing me to participate in this. And let's uh, learn about the sphere of Yesod. So Yesod is, I guess, I guess maybe we should just do a quick introduction of what the spherot are. So <laughs> the spherot are sort of the, the divine energies that God made the world out of. So, so the, the world is, is something God made out of nothing. There was you know, there was nothing there, and then God made something, which is this world. But the the deeper commentaries say that God made nothing out of something, because really, this world is nothing compared to God. All there was before this world was something, which was God, and then he made nothing, which is this world. Um, but nonetheless, we look at it from our perspective, which is that God made something out of nothing, meaning to say that before this world, there was nothing other than God. Um, but now there's something, there's this world. So how did God do that? So God, it's um, what's, what's so interesting about Einstein is Einstein has given us the math to understand what the Torah has been saying forever. So what is the math to explain this amazing process of making something out of nothing? It's E equals MC squared, which means basically that energy becomes mass. You can take energy and form something material out of energy. 
So what is the ultimate energy source is light, divine light. So God took the outer garment of his divine light, this aspect of himself, not his entirety, but this aspect of his divine light, which is energy, which is like the highest, highest form of energy. And with that energy, he made something material, which is the physical universe. So that's, that's the idea. Now, this energy can be sort of subdivided into 10 different ingredients. Like if you're going to make a recipe, like you might have 10 ingredients on your kitchen table that you're making the recipe from. So the recipe from the universe is coming from these 10 different frequencies of light. And all of this light, basically, are just frequencies of the olive base, right? The, the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So when we say that God made the world out of the Hebrew letters, the Hebrew letters are all energy wavelengths. And that's one way of understanding them. So that initial divine energy that God made the universe out of are, are, are the wavelengths of the olive bays that eventually become crystallized into letters that you can see printed in a book. But the roots of these letters are energy wavelengths. That's one paradigm. Another paradigm is to see it as ten sphero. Okay, so you have to understand that when you're getting into the mystical sources and things like that, you have different paradigms, different paradigms, different ways to approach it. And um, each paradigm is going to have associated with it a different vocabulary. Okay, so you have the vocabulary of the letters, the 22 letters of the olive base that God made the world out of. It's a very authentic, beautiful, holy paradigm. But now we're dwelling in another paradigm right now. We're dwelling within the 10 sphere up, these 10 energy sources. So it's another way of approaching this idea. Okay. So now, within these 10 sphere of, you can divide the 10 sphere of into, let's say, initially, two sections. You have the upper three sphere of, and the lower seven sphere of. And to uh, give you a little bit of Kabbalistic terminology, the upper three sphero would be called the Gimel Rishonos. Gimel means three. Rish, Rishon means initial or beginning, first. So, so the upper three and the lower seven. Now the lower seven, again, just to give you a little Kabbalistic terminology here, that lower seven is called the Zion Tachtonim. That means the lower seven. So you've got the 10 sphero, the upper three and the lower seven. Very good. Now at this initial cosmic event called Shvirus HaKalim, the shattering of the vessels, you have a separation between the upper three and the lower seven. The lower seven, which, which, which are really the etzim, the essence of this world, this material universe. And when I say material universe, I'm talking about all four worlds going up to Atsilus, that's that that all falls under the category of this material universe. By the way, that's another paradigm to look at this world as the four worlds. Okay, so so far we, we've got three paradigms here: the four worlds, the ten sphero, the 22 letters. Okay, these are all overlapping on similar concepts. So when you have the shattering of the vessels. You have a very important teaching here. The upper three sphero, Achma, Bina, and Das, the first letters of those three words spell Chabad, that's where the word Chabad comes from, were never damaged. They were not damaged in the shattering of the vessels, in the Shvir Sakalim. Very important piece of information. The lower seven were, they were destroyed and then rebuilt. Okay. Now, as you go down from above to below, you have the highest, you have chesed, and you have below that gvura, and below that you have the reconciliation of those two energies, you have teferet, so now there's balance, then you have netzach, then you have hod, okay, which are also like on opposite sides in the way that chesed and gvura are. And just like teferit balances 
chesed and gevura is balanced by teferit, so too yesod that we're going to talk about today is going to balance netzach and hod. Okay, so, so yesod is a very, very, very fundamental keystone sphera. They all are, but, but when you look at it in sort of like an uh, above to below way, um, yesod plays a very, very key role. So yesod is going to balance all of these higher energies, okay? And that is the sixth sphera. And then below that, I told you, you have the upper three and the lower seven. Below that, you have malchus, which is the dimension that we live in, okay? And that correlates also, if you want to think of it in terms of the four worlds, that correlates with olamasiya, which is the world of action. So you can call this realm that we live in the world of action. And we're going to talk about that. That ties into Yisod in a moment. Because this world is about doing, right? Like in the modern zeitgeist, there's a tremendous emphasis that's put on how you feel. And how you feel is important. But guess what? The Torah doesn't put the emphasis so much on how you feel. It's important how you feel especially if you're thinking about how other people feel, because you've got to respect other people's feelings, right? But you will, don't want to get trapped up or paralyzed within your own feelings. There's a certain sickness that's associated with that, right? You don't want to be trapped within your own feelings. You want the divine flow to come from above and to flow through you, which means it's got to get out of you, right? It's got to go from the realm of your own feelings into your own actions. Because this world is about action. And that's why the mitzvot are all action-oriented. It's either do this thing or don't do this thing. But when you refrain from doing this thing, that takes so much energy that that's also an action. So they're all actions. The doing and the not doing are all in the realm of actions because they take such effort and you need it to come through you. Okay, so now let's zero in a little bit. We said you've got the top three that were never damaged and you've got the lower seven. And by the way, one of the main models of what it means to be a complete human being is that you have to bring, you see there's an aspect to your soul which is inside you and there's an aspect of your soul the same soul, your soul, which exists outside of your body. So there's this continuum of your soul within your body to outside your body. And you, the, the aspect of your soul that goes outside your body goes all the way up to the Kisei of Kavit, all the way up to the throne of glory. Okay. So the aspect of your soul, which is outside of your body, correlates with the top three sphere road, which were never broken, which means that you have brokenness within you, but you also have wholeness. Now, the wholeness that's a part of you exists outside of you. But when you do mitzvot, you bring those top sphere road into you. So by doing Torah, by doing mitzvahs, by singing holy psalms, singing also, if it's done with holiness, brings those top three aspects, those unbroken parts of creation back inside of you, okay? So these are all important models. Now, within the bottom seven, right, which was really kind of our lives in this world, unless we're really doing well and we're bringing that, that higher aspect into ourselves. Within that seven, if you just think of it on a more universal scale, not so much within the person right now, but just imagine an x-ray of the universe, you've got the higher three and the lower seven. Now that lower seven can be broken down into six and one. Okay, so now we're kind of drilling down on the paradigm. Now, the top six, that's called Yesod. And the bottom one, that's called Malchus. 
Now, many times when people talk about heaven and earth, they're talking about the spheres of Malchus, the one that we're in right now. That would be Malchus, that's earth. And when we talk about heaven, we're really talking about Yesod. We're talking about those top six above us. Because Yesod is really two ideas. Yesod is the sixth sphera, number six, out of 10, okay? But, or rather, out of seven. But Yesod is also the combination of the top six. You understand? So we can talk about it as an individual sphera, or we can talk about it as a conglomeration of chesed, gevura, teferet, netzach, hod, yesod. All of those, when they're together, go by the name yesod. And now there's another bit of Kabbalistic terminology, which is that when we're talking about those six, yesod as a conglomeration of divine energy, that is the term zer anpin. So you often see that term, zer anpin. That's talking about these six when they're together. So a lot of this world, a lot of this world is going to be the interaction between heaven and earth, or to put it in sphera terms, between Malchus, this dimension that we live in, and Yesod, which is the heaven above. So basically, you want to get the Yesod in the Malchus because that means that the higher energy from above is flowing into this world, okay? Now, now listen to this, because we have, we have some different imagery going on simultaneously, and let's, let's kind of look into it and explore. If you think of Yesod as this divine flow coming down into this world, then Yesod is really life force. Okay, Yesod is really life force. Like imagine this divine waterfall coming down into this great ocean. The ocean would be this world and the divine waterfall would be Yesod pouring down into this world. So in that sense, Yesod really represents potential because what are you gonna do with, with all of that life force coming into you? So in that aspect, Yesod represents potential. On the other hand, we have a very important verse in the Torah, which is Tzadik Yesod Olam. That the Tzadik, the holy person, right? is the foundation of the world. Now, if you've been following what I've just been saying, you hear a bit of a contradiction. Is Yesod potential? Like it's coming down the life force into this world? Or is it the foundation of this world? In which case it would more likely correlate with Malchus, which is this realm that we live in right now. Sadik Yesodolam. The Sadik is the foundation of this world. So is it potential or is it actualization? <laughs> That's our question. Is Yesod potential or is it actualization? So now to answer this question, I want to tell you a Hasidic piece of history. Rebelebele Eger was one of the great Hasidic masters. And he was best friends with Reb Tzadik Akain. And they were both very close students, the closest students of the Ishbitzer Rebbe, right? So this is, and you know, and connected to Kutsk as well. So this is very, these are the highest, holiest names in Polish Hasidis, you know, or a few of them anyway. So Reb Leibla Eger 
when he first became a Rebbe, right? So this is like a big, big event. And he's like becoming a Rebbe. And during his first speech, his inaugural address as being a Rebbe, he discussed the following passage in the Torah. And you're going to see we're, we're discussing how a tzaddik, right? Because we have a question. On the one hand, the tzaddik is the divine flow, which means it's like the life force, but it also means on some level potential energy because it hasn't reached this realm yet. But on the other hand, the tzaddik is the foundation of this world, which means he's making this world. So what is it? Is it potential energy or is it this world itself? What, what, what is it? So our, the, the answer to our question is going to be addressed by Rebbe Leibla Eger in his inaugural address as Rebbe, okay? When Karach, who led a rebellion against Moshe Rabbeinu, he wanted to be the Kayin Gadol. He wanted to be the high priest of Israel, but you know, God had already chosen who the high priest of Israel was going to be, and it was going to be Aaron Akoin. So, so Hashem made uh, a test. Moshe says that all the leaders of all the tribes should take their stick, their, you know, which was a sign of their leadership of their tribe, and they should put it in the Mishkan, in the Holy Tabernacle. And the one whose stick will blossom with almonds and almond flowers. That is going to be the one that Hashem is choosing to be the leader. And so they all put their sticks in there. And then sure enough, Aaron's stick is the one that blossomed. Okay? And so that's divine, further divine proof after the earthquake ate up all the rebels anyway. So that was really divine proof, but this was even further divine proof that Aaron is the leader. Okay, and Aaron, of course, is one of the greatest tzaddikim in the history of creation. Okay, so now, what does Reb Label Eger say about this? And why did he choose this event as his first speech as Rebbe? Because the Torah uses a very interesting phraseology. And Reb Lebel Eger is identifying this and he's telling everybody, these are our marching orders. These are the words that we're going to live by. You ready for this? He says that you would think that the way the passage reads in the Torah is, God told everyone, put your stick in the tabernacle and the one whose stick blossomed, past tense, is the one who's going to be the leader. And in fact, only one stick blossomed, past tense. But that's not what the Torah says. The Torah says it in the future tense. The Torah says, everyone put your stick in the Mishkan, and the one whose stick will have blossomed. It's a form of the future tense, meaning that the righteous person is always in the state of becoming. That the sign of righteousness is, are you continuing to unfold in Kedusha and in holiness? It's not about what have you accomplished, it's what are you still trying to bring into this world? You have to constantly be working on yourself and bringing down, what did I say to you? That there are three levels above you of your soul. It's correlating with the Gimel Roshonos, the top three spherot, and you have to constantly be bringing the higher aspect of your soul into your soul, into your body. It's a very exalted idea that the Pischei Sharm talks about, Rav Yitzhak Isaac Haber. We think 
Transcendence is leaving yourself. I'm getting out of myself. I am transcending myself. I am leaving myself behind because I'm going to such a high spiritual level. Guess what? That's not it. Do you know what transcendence is? You're bringing your higher self into your present self. You're bringing the unbrokenness of creation, the unbroken aspect of your soul into your soul. That's transcendence. That's what transcendence is. So now let's return to our question and I'll show you how we just answered it. On the one hand, we want to say that Yesod is life force. Yesod is this potential energy flowing down into this world. But then we said, but wait a second, this world is all about action. The name of this world is action. Alumasia, I got to do stuff. I got to take that light that's within me and manifest it outside of me. And the Pusik says, Tzadik Yesod alum, that Tzadik is the foundation of this world. Well, wait a second. Is Yesod talking about this world or is it talking about the potential energy flowing into this world? Which is it? And now we have the answer that Tzadik is the one who is constantly becoming. He is the merger of the water flow coming into this world and this world and the fact that he never stops striving, he never stops becoming. That is the tzaddik. Now I'm gonna tell it to you in another way. We'll do another visual paradigm, okay? Yesod is the number, is the, is the number six, okay? Guess what? That's the letter Vav. A Vav is a straight line. You want to hear something amazing? Do you know what it says in the Mishnah, in all of us? Your hand is a series of vubs. See your fingers? Each finger is the letter vub. Look at all the vubs that you have. Right? Why? Because, and remember, vub is your soul. Because what do I want to do? I want to take that life force from above and I want to put it in action through my hands, through my doing. It's that divine flow from Yesod being the waterfall, the life force coming into this world to being the foundation of doing. With my hands, I take the potential, the vav, and then I actualize it through action. Now listen to this. They say, how does a tzaddik, someone who's doing all of these things, taking his life force, his higher self, his higher soul, and putting it into this world? How do you know when it happens? And by the way, There's an aspect of sitkis, of this type of holiness, which exists in all of us. So maybe you look in the mirror and you say, well, I'm not the Lubavitcher Rebbe. I'm not a quote unquote tzaddik. But nonetheless, Reb Tzaddik Akon brings down something very, very interesting. He says that it's possible to be a tzaddik within one mitzvah. In other words, maybe it's true you're not a tzaddik. Maybe it's true. But maybe there's a mitzvah, and Rebbe Nachman of Breslov emphasizes all of us have to pick one mitzvah to be an expert in. You have to pick one mitzvah that you love, and you have to learn the laws of that mitzvah, and you have to be an expert in that mitzvah. So there is, says Reb Tzadik Cohen, based on a Gomorrah, such a concept as being a Tzadik 
in a particular mitzvah, you can become a tzaddik in a mitzvah. So even all of us can reach that exalted level of tzaddik, even if we're not getting everything right in our life, even if there are many fundamental mitzvahs that we may not be doing yet, nonetheless, all the mitzvahs are connected with each other. And if I can get one mitzvah down that I'm really working on, then I can pour so much light from above out into this world. In other words, maybe a lot of the infrastructure is broken, but if I've got one pipeline that's working, then it's working. <laughs> There's, it's working. The faucet is on and it's going from outside, from the higher realms through me into this world. So all of us should strive to do that. Now listen to this. Rabbi Reichman brings a passage in a book that I highly recommend if you want to learn more about all of these topics called Flames of Faith. Flames of Faith. You can get that book, a very, very good book, very deep, very informative, very readable. He brings the following passage, that when the Baal Shem Tov, the Baal Shem Tov, it's funny because he is the one who really got rid of these practices among tzaddikim. Back in the day, early tzaddikim would roll in snow and they would basically, they would basically, uh, Silence the flesh. That, that was the idea. We don't do that anymore. That's not really part of Jewish practice today, and no one should try to reinvigorate this. This is a dead topic now, okay? But, but he was one of the last to do this. The idea was that you are reasserting your mastery over your, over your own flesh by telling your flesh that it doesn't have the last word. But we don't do it through these type of practices anymore. But the tzaddikim till this day go to the mikvah. And back in the day of the Bashem Tov, he would chisel out the ice cover of a river and go into literally freezing cold water to take a mikvah. As many, 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 many tzaddikim have done. And I, I can tell you in my own life, I've been in a few cold mikvahs where I literally thought I was having a heart attack and I'm not being humorous at all. So if you, if you want to know whether this is a very difficult spiritual practice to do, it's a very difficult spiritual practice. And, and someone like the Baal Shem Tov was on the level where they were doing it all the time. Okay, what's the point? The point is I'm going to give you a very, very deep understanding of a couple of verses from Tehillim, from the Psalms of King David. This is chapter 19. Verses 4 and verses 5. Okay, I'm going to read it to you in English. There is no speech and there are no words. Their sound is not heard. But their line goes forth throughout the earth. And their words reach the end of the inhabited world. I'm going to read it one more time. I'm going to tell you a very deep explanation for this. There is no speech and there are no words. Their sound is not heard, but their precision, their line, goes forth throughout the earth and their words reach the end of the inhabited world. Okay. So what does that mean? 
So in Rabbi Reichman's book, The Flames of Faith, he explains, quoting another source, he explains what that means. That the mysterious nefesh, what is mysterious nefesh? That's a really important term if you don't know it. Mysterious nefesh means that when you do a mitzvah, that's very, very difficult for you to do when you do it anyway. Like going into an ice cold mikvah, for instance. That basically there's a burst of energy that you bring from above through you into this world. And that energy, although wordless and soundless, influences and affects people around the world. And the great, great Siddiquim were blasting out energy through their mysterious nefesh. And they were bringing people in foreign countries around the world to Chuba to return to God. And it said that the Baal Shem Tov and Reb Elimelech of Luzhensk, that they brought approximately 80,000 souls back to Torah. Some of it was done by standing in front of a group of people and saying awesome words. And a lot of it was done without saying a single word. Through their actions. Tzadik Yesod Olam. The Tzadik is the foundation of the world. Now, with people like, like us, right? Or I'll just speak for myself. You know, you're not a big tzaddik, but maybe you can get one mitzvah right. And as long as you've got that pipeline in place, you can be blasting at that light. And maybe your light won't reach the Jews of Hungary, but maybe they'll reach the people in your neighborhood. It's all levels. It's all levels. Or maybe they'll reach the whole world because we go up and down. And during a moment where we really get it right and we really bring our higher self into ourself, at that moment, you can absolutely blast. You can blast beyond your level, beyond your pay scale, you can blast. So Rabbi Reichman brings something further, something really amazing. This is incredible. People love to share good news. Why do people love to share good news? Listen to this unbelievable Kabbalistic explanation to why people love to share good news. This is incredible. Because who is the ultimate sharer of good news? Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet, announces the arrival of Mashiach. That is the best news anyone is ever going to share in history. He's here! He's come! Eliyahu gets to share that news, which means that whenever someone shares good news, they have an aspect of Eliyahu in them, a bit of the soul of Eliyahu in them. Now, Eliyahu never dies. And he went up to heaven like he just ascended to heaven. So we have a tradition among the rabbis in the Agadita that Serach, who's the one who told Yaakov Avinu that Yosef was still alive. Remember, it's one of the most interesting problems that, that's ever happened in world history, which is what if you had a piece of news which was so good, the news was so good to share it would kill the listener. <laughs> This problem actually existed. I have such good news, but if I tell you, it will kill you. That's how good a news it is. 
No, really, it's that good news. It will kill you to hear it. <laughs> so, so that was the problem with telling Yaakov Avinu that Yosef was still alive. They didn't know how to do it because they were afraid they were going to kill him with the good news. So they got Sarah, who is a daughter of Asher, to play the harp. She was like, you know, very musically gifted. And while she was playing this music, she weaved into the music the news that Yosef was still alive. That's how she was able to deliver the good news, which tells you something about the power of music and how it expands your soul and your vessel, that you would be able to receive something that ordinarily might actually do damage to you. So Sarah lives forever. The rabbis teach that she's one of these people who just ascended to heaven. So now we have a Kabbalistic way of understanding this. Because Sarah gave the best news ever, which is an aspect of Eliyahu. And because Eliyahu ascended to heaven whole, Sarah, who had that same energy within her to give this level of fantastic news, was also able to ascend whole. <laughs> I mean, these explanations are beyond, right? Okay, so let's, we're going to just review what we went over, and then we'll have time for questions. Everything is about flow. Everything is about divine flow. You want to take the light that's coming into you always. That's your soul. That's the love. There's a, a remember when God creates the world, he, he makes this area within himself and he clears it out. Okay. That's, that's like the womb, so to speak. God clears out this area within himself. And of course, the Kabbalistic joke is this area, which he emptied out of his divine light, is also full of divine light, right? But God just wanted to lessen the light so that we would have free choice, so that God's presence wouldn't be so overwhelming that we'd have no free will. God wanted to create a realm where there was free will. So he created this region within himself where he lessened the amount of light so that we would go, maybe yes, maybe not. Maybe I should do the right thing. Maybe I shouldn't do the right thing. Also that we, from our own standpoint, would choose to do the right thing. Okay. Now he shines this ray of light into this vacuum, quote unquote vacuum. You know, even that has divine light in it. And this ray of light is a straight line. That straight line is the letter Vav. That's Yesod. It's called the Kav. God shines this light. And this light is actually not just creating the universe, but this light moment to moment is going straight from above into me. Okay, that's the Vav. That's the Vav of the Yudke Vavke. Right? Remember, whenever you think of the divine name, spell it from above to below. Yud and He and Vav and He. The bottom He represents this world. The Vav, right, is the connector from the lower world to the higher world. So that letter Vav is Yesod, because Yesod is the sixth sphere out of the seven. And the letter Vav is the sixth letter of the olive base. So Yesod is that connection from below to above. The Tzaddik is the connector between heaven and earth. That is, by the way, why the Hasidic custom is to give the sixth aliyah to the Tzaddik. The Rebbe gets the sixth aliyah. Why? Because the Rebbe is number six, so to speak. He is the Vav. He is the connector between heaven and earth. But you know something? Each individual person, if you do a profile, 
Each individual person is the letter Vav. We're all Vavs. We're all Vavs. We're all given the tools to connect heaven and earth together. We do that through the Torah mitzvahs. That's what the Torah mitzvahs are. What is a mitzvah? It's translated as a commandment, but that's a very bad translation. Mitzvah has the root tzav, which means to connect, as in connecting heaven and earth. Mitzvahs are connectors. We connect with God, we connect heaven and earth together. Toward what end? Well, on one level, to bring heaven down to earth. But if you get into the deeper sfarim, the deeper holy books, that's true. You want to connect heaven down to earth, but really what you're doing is bringing earth up to heaven. So Hashem should bless us all. We should remember all of this has to be made practical because we live in the realm of the practical. So my holy homework assignment to all of you is to think what mitzvah do you want to be a tzaddikin or a tzaddikis? And it should be some a mitzvah that you love to do, not one that's hard for you, one that you love to do. And then find someone that you can learn the laws of that mitzvah in so that you can become knowledgeable about how to perform it. And then do that because you then will have the most amazing pipeline built within you, where you can project your light all over the world and raise everybody up in terms of their spiritual level and this whole world up to heaven. Amen. Rab David, thank you, as always, for the incredible, incredible words of Torah. Um, chidushim upon Chidushim. And uh, it's just, it's where we, it's just a chut to have you be a part of this Omer Aliyah initiative. And B'zat Hashem, come Shavuot time, these words should permeate ourselves, our psyches, um, and and uh, we should transform into the the, the greatest clay possible. Um, for those of you who are watching the recorded version on YouTube right now, B'zat Hashem, we will see you in one week for the final Omer Aliyah class of Malchut. Uh, and yeah, wishing you all a wonderful and blessed rest of your week of Yasod.